What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over what is essentially Projectiles Part 2, but really it's like Special Attacks Part 2, or Part 1 even of Special Attacks. It's a little bit confusing, I didn't know what to call this one, because it's not quite a projectile, but we're going to go over kind of uh, the setup for these projectiles, because we did a projectile which was a fireball, and that's good, but there's a lot of different projectiles in fighting games, and, and games in general. And we want to cover them all, or at least a large majority of the concepts so that you can create uh, whatever projectile you want. Now, uh, today we're going to be doing like this rising tornado right here. So I'm sure you've seen things like that where you perform an attack and then the something comes up from the ground and attacks the opponent. Sometimes it inches forward toward them. Uh, example I can think of off the top of my head is like Conra's attack that uh, goes underground from Killer Instinct, but there are many, many examples of this. So I'm going to enter a command that's going to do this Rising Tornado, it's going to be able to hit them twice. They can block it and all, of course, and that won't put them in the launch and all these different things, but that logic is already logic that actually exists within our character, so we don't have to do anything additional for that. The main thing we have to focus on today is actually just performing the command, which we already know how to do, and then specifically triggering the logic we want. And this is a little bit harder than you might expect. It's not too bad, but when you get into these specific attacks, these projectiles that don't have to deal with the animation, then you do get into more complex things because you have to essentially define all the logic for it. And that's okay, that's intended. That's not, uh, you know, that's not a hack, that's not hard-coded. It just, it gets to a point when you have something specific you want in your game that you need to do it a certain way. And we need to do this a very specific way to get everything working the way we want. So let's get started today. I am gonna consider this a projectile, but um, to be completely honest, like I said, it is it's not really a projectile in my eyes, it's more of just a special attack, but I'm going to consider it a projectile because it will also help make the hitboxes better to differentiate. It'll be, it'll be easier to determine what type of attack we have if we make things that our character does not have to actually do to collide with a projectile. Or if you'd like, you can go ahead and make an entirely different hitbox for these types of attacks. Regardless of how you're doing it, we are going to need to adjust our hitbox logic a bit because in the last projectile episode I attached the hitbox but I did not actually use it at all. So we were just going off the collision of the projectile and the um, particle system that it had on it. Which is fine, it will work, but it is kind of invalidate the entire point of having a hitbox. Sure the, ha the hitbox has the data, but I mean if you're not using the hitbox for a collision then you have to change the particle system if you want to change the collision or change the frames and things like that uh, for where it can hit the opponent. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to make our life harder than it has to be. So first things first, if you have not seen any episodes of this tutorial series and you're trying to figure out what's going on, I will leave a link right here to the very first iCard. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. I'll leave a link in this iCard right here to the very first episode of the fighting game tutorial series. We're at episode 60 now, so we are quite far along and we've done quite a few lessons. We still have plenty to go. Feel free to join us in our journey. And I will also go ahead and link the specific projectile part one episode to this. This is the main thing you'll need to catch up on if you want to do this episode. Just because we are going to use projectile logic, we're going to make a child class of our default projectile and spawn it from there. All right, so let's get started. Now in our hitbox actor.h, I am going to add another value to this hitbox enum. So e hitbox enum was proximity strike throw and hurtbox. I've added projectile. And I think this is important because even if you treat the projectile the same as a strike hitbox essentially. You still want to make sure that the damage and the size and all those things of the hitbox can be determined via the the anmbp function create projectile hitbox and we want to make sure that the projectile hitbox can automatically move with its actor and things like that. 
We don't want to necessarily do too much on the strike hitbox itself, otherwise things are going to get confusing. We're going to have things we don't need. So giving this extra projectile enum gives us a little bit more freedom. Now you don't need to do anything else here, or even in code for that matter, but I am going to do something just to make things a little bit neater and show you how they should be. I'll leave a, an I card in the top right corner if you want to take a look at how I've done my commands for this series. So a series of inputs that perform an action. But I've had these commands set up in the fighter template character, which is my base character. I've gone ahead and removed them from that and put them into the character they belong in. Now, it doesn't really matter. Um, however, you're not going to want to have your commands in your base character because that means every character that is a child of it would have access to those unless you override them and specifically tell them not to. Because of that, it's much better to just put them in your child class. I was just using that as an example, but now we're getting to the point where we're actually using these commands actively, and I think it's about time we move them out. Now, moving them out should be very simple. So, you can see I have nothing related to them anymore um, at the bottom of my constructor for my fighter template character. However, I did not move anything out of my header file for them because I still need my structures for my commands. They still need to be in my header file. That way every child of this can have those access to those structures. My actual variables like input buffer and character commands also need to be in here because we don't want to move those to the child class and have to put them in every single child class. The children will have access to them by default. Lastly, my functions for these checking input buffers and all, they can stay the same and stay in the fighter template character CPP. The only thing we're moving out to anywhere else is the stuff in the constructor. We're moving it to the constructor of our specific character, in my case, mute character. So where we set the number of them and where we set up the commands. And now that these are mutant only, this is good. The only other thing I've added is I've added a new command, command five, and um, I've called it rising tornado because it sounds like a fancy name that would work for this. And I make it ADA or left, right, left. Back, forward, back. All right. And now that's all I've got for the code. So we've set our, we've added our new hitbox enum variable and we've had, um, we've moved over our commands from our fighter template character to our mutant character. Now we can go into Unreal. There's a few things we need in here, of course. Uh, we don't need anything too specific that we've already done. The only thing we, we're going to need is we're going to need our mutant anim BP, of course. Pretty much we'll always need that guy. And then I'm going to have something called projectile up from ground, which is going to be the actual tornado attack, flame tornado attack. And then I'm having this thing called ground spawn actor, which might seem a little bit weird, but when we get to it, you'll see why. It's more useful, a lot more useful than just for this video. So I figured it's about time we implement something like this. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into our mutant anim BP. First things first, we need our animation that we're going to want to use to trigger our um, projectile, our tornado. And we're gonna need a state and everything, all the logic we normally do to call this. If you've been following the series, you can just copy the logic where you take this specific command and say has use command and that's how you go to the state and then it just returns on idle. But if you haven't, I'll go over it really quickly. So right click and hit add state. This is assuming you have an idle state and we're going to go to it. So uh, drag something from idle to the command and then from the command back to idle. I name my commands their actual name. These two are just random attacks that I switch out for testing. And then I have Fireball, Hurricane Kick, and Rising Tornado. Now, to get to any command, all I do is I have this logic. It's the same logic for all commands. It essentially just checks if I've used the command from this array and, and uh, this specific value. If I have, we can enter. And then I have no transition on the command to idle. I just make it automatic rule-based. It is important, as always, that you have your start transition event for end command transition when returning from a command back to idle, and start attack transition when going from idle to the command. Lastly, go into your actual animation, make sure it does not loop, and let's take a look at the animation. If I could play it, there we go. And it's this attack right here. 
So this is just the Mixamo animation where he's uh, raising his hand. And I've given him two anim notifies. We don't specifically use grab enemy lo uh, location. We don't specifically use grab enemy location here, but you could. I'm gonna show you how you can and what you can do with it. And grab enemy location is essentially here to grab the location of the enemy early. That way um, the attack can be a little bit delayed. So the way it's working now where I have the spawn rising projectile, this will uh, grab the enemy's location and spawn it basically right on top of them. It essentially makes it very difficult for them to dodge it. They'd have to basically read your animation and jump out of the way at the right time to be able to dodge it. So you should probably give them some buffer. I didn't end up doing that in this episode just because I'm not controlling the other player. So it was easier for me to just do it while they were there, while they were moving. And, uh, you know, actually be able to hit them. And we'll cover why this, why each of these could be useful. But go ahead and add one or both of these. You definitely need the spawn rising projectile and a notify. However, you can choose whether you want this one or not. And you can also see how many frames this animation is. And this is why we need to cut down our animations to be a set number of frames, because that will make our life look a lot better in the in the end. And also, it'll just make the game play a lot better. So. You can see some of these animations are like 4,000 frames. Anyway, that's for another time. So once you've added your anim notifies, you're good to go. You can close out of your animation if you'd like. And now your state machine should be good. So once you've defined your controls, and remember I made mine ADA, you should be able to trigger this attack. There's one other thing I want to say about this. Of course, if you're having trouble triggering, triggering your attack, make sure you look at your mutant character BP or whatever character it is BP and look at the inputs in here. So since we did make it visible in Blueprint, the character itself has it visible and it's possible that some of their things got changed by mistake. Make sure these match up with what you have in code. If not, just fix them right here and then you should be able to use the command. Okay, and now we're good to go there. We're going to need to spawn our projectile and do some extra logic here, but uh, that's not too bad. I think first things first, let's go ahead and make our projectile because if we don't make our projectile, we're not gonna see anything when we spawn it and then the logic's gonna look a little bit weird. So go ahead and go to where you made your fireball. Now, if you haven't made your fireball, it's okay. We can go ahead and make a new one. But if you did make the fireball already from our previous episode, I call this default projectile BP. Like the default projectile should probably be empty. That has projectile logic, and then the fireball should be its own. But as long as we know that the fireball is the default, that's, that's perfectly okay. Now, the way the fireball works is it's pretty simple. We call a spawn, uh, spawn projectile on it, and then we check if what direction we're facing, and then just give it projectile movement and move it that direction. So it's pretty simple. Basically, on collision, we're going to trigger this hit effect, which is this fire explosion. Now, there's a few things we want different from this child, but there's also some things we want to stay the same. We want, for example, the particle system, and even the projectile movement in this case. I don't believe we use it for this projectile, so you could feel free to make a new blueprint entirely, remove the projectile movement component, and keep everything else. But there are going to be other projectiles, of course, where we use projectile movement, so not the end of the world right now. Just make sure you optimize where possible. Okay, and there is one more thing I want to do in the default projectile, though. I have these new booleans called should display hit effect and should be dis destroyed upon collision. So I've gone ahead and I just added these as variables to this default projectile class. Now the reason for these things, so should display hit effect, what that really means is when this collides with the player, should we display this effect? And the reason I've added that is, so for example in this tornado, I don't actually want to do anything with the tornado when I cause a hit. We may want to display a particle effect on the character or something showing they've been hit, but we don't need to display a hit effect with this particle system. At least I did not feel the need to. If you have the need to, then great, go for it. But if you don't have the need to and you want to save memory and time, quite frankly, then you can go ahead and add a boolean here. And you don't have to set this anywhere in the graph, you just literally determine its value. So by default, I'm setting it to be true, since the default is the fireball, and upon collision, it's going to blow up. 
I also have, should be destroyed upon collision. So we were also destroying this fireball when it collided. We were playing the hit effect and then destroying actor, which is good for the fireball. For the rising tornado, you can see that it actually was hitting the opponent twice. And that was intended. I actually wanted it to continue. And because I wanted it to continue, I don't want it to be destroyed if it collides with the player. So I also have this balloon should be destroyed upon collision, which is true for the fireball. That's the default. But since this new projectile is a child and the way you can make a child class is you can either add new and select this as your class or just right click on your parent class and create child blueprint class. That's the easiest way. When you're in your child class though, now if you go to your class defaults here, you have all the variables that it has. So I can say, I don't want to display a hit effect and I don't want to be destroyed upon collision for this projectile, as we're calling it, for the tornado. I've also removed the hit effect entirely to save some space. So you can see how I can use this to greatly differentiate between the two, even though they're parent-child. I just thought that was important to mention. And we will actually use these variables upon collision and you'll see you'll see what the difference is and, and why we needed it. At this point, you can close your default projectile. The logic we're going to be doing is going to be strictly in the uh, projectile up from ground. Again, up from ground is my tornado. And basically, it just means any any attack that you want to bring up from the ground and, and deal damage to your opponent. You can use this for multiple different projectiles, multiple different special attacks in your game. So it does not have to be this flame tornado. Just as I said with the fireball earlier, make sure that when you're making a child class, you just change the mesh and keep everything as optimized as you can. The actual logic of projectile up from ground is not too hard. And that's why I wanted to start with this one because some of these projectiles can get very complicated very quickly. Like if you've seen one where the character shoots it maybe up into the air and then it splits apart and then hones in on the player and you have like three or four of them chasing the player, that can get very complicated. I don't know if it seems like it would be, but it can. It depends on how you do it and how specific you need the logic to be. In this case, it's pretty easy because we're just going to spawn it a little bit below the player and it's going to rise. This will help because if they jump over it, it can still hit them while they're falling down, or if they're on the ground, it can hit them twice. So the logic here is intended to work the way it's working. In our up from ground, we're going to need a begin play and we're gonna need a custom event called event spawn projectile. Now, I know I said close this, but just to show you, I'm not making a new custom event. Spawn projectile is a custom event within our default projectile BP. So if I look for this at any point, you can see I have the spawn projectile event. If I look for this in any child classes, like right click spawn projectile, then I can actually grab event spawn projectile. I don't have to make a new one. Again, another perk of it being a child, I already have the same event, the same event that gets called by, you know, wherever it's getting called. In this case, we're going to call it from the mutant and MVP. We actually create the projectile hitbox and then spawn the projectile. This will now work for any projectile we have. It's not gonna be spawning the, the uh, fireball in this case, it's gonna be spawning the tornado. Okay, so we're gonna need those two things. So grab them and then the all these things should be inherited. So you try not to add these, but we're gonna need to use the particle system. Now, our particle system is this thing. It's what has all this effect. So you can go ahead and set your effect here, set your size if you want and change all your parameters. We're going to use this and get the location to set the start location and the end location of where we want this to go. This is pretty much the, the method you'll use for any sort of movement you want to trigger that's not determined by an AI or something that is, you know, moving kind of on its own or, or moving based on knowledge. Since we just want this projectile, this special attack to go from one point to another, from the ground to up above, you know, at ground level, then we need to go ahead and trigger this at the correct spots. So go ahead and make two vectors. I've added a variable start location and an end location, and their types are vector. And here's how we're going to do it. Take the particle system component you can just drag it on the screen and do get world location now this is a little bit confusing because the world location is actually it's not going to be like the bottom or the top 
It's usually supposed to be where this default scene root is, but to be honest, I found that not to be true. A lot of times it'll be in the center. It kind of depends because I think Unreal uses uh, different parts of the actor to do it based on what's going on, like based on the size of your template here and all that. And I think you'll see more about what I mean when we get in there because the pixels, the measurements that we take will be a little bit off depending on the size of it and things like that. Okay, so here we have your Git World location. You can flat out just drag that into Start Location. We're going to set the location of where this should spawn in the NMBP when we spawn it. And thus the location on Begin Play when it spawned will already be in the correct spot to have its start location. We don't really need a start location in this case other than to LARP it which is how we're gonna move it from one point to another. But other than that, you're not gonna use it. So just know that we're setting this so that we can go from one point to the next and that's it. Now for the end location, you can do whatever you want. Quite frankly, all I've done is I've broken the world location, added 100 to the Z, which is the height. You can see the blue line here is the up and down. And then set the end location to be the same X and Y, but a higher Z. That will move it from lower down in the level to higher up in the level. And you can change this value. You don't have to hard code it. You can pass it in, whatever you want to do. But this value just essentially, we're setting an end location so we know two points to go between the start and the end location. Then in our spawn projectile event, we need to create a new timeline, which is something we haven't done on here, I don't believe, in this series. Uh, so actually the term is add timeline, like this. And w once you click it, it's gonna be a little bit weird. I'm gonna go through another one with you just so you can see it. It's got all this stuff in it and there's a lot of stuff you can do here. We don't need most of this stuff, but it comes with all of it, so. Now, we're going to want to double click on the timeline and it's going to bring up this menu, okay? It looks like this. And again, if you haven't seen this before, this is weird. So you have your length here. Uh, you can also rename this, by the way, if you want to rename. And you can call it like test timeline. Of course, name it what you want. I call it my move up timeline up here. And then here you go. So once you go to your node here, there's a few things that you may want to do. So first things first, we want to set our length to the, the length is our time. So you can see in our move up timeline, I've set the length of the rising tornado to be 2.5. So that should be 2.5 seconds. But you can set it to be whatever you want, set it to one if you want, doesn't matter. And then you can go ahead and add a float track here, which will give you this little graph. And essentially it means how much of this value that I'm doing. In this case, we're, we're going up over time. Okay, um, how much of that should be done at which point in the timeline? So do we want it to be even? Do we want it to be linear where it's rising at the same rate? Do we want it to be slow at first and then it rises really fast at the end? That's what you're determining here. Now it's a little confusing when you're first looking at that and I don't blame you. You can name your track here like a uh, timeline value, okay? And then you can go ahead and just add these. You can right click and add a key to each of these values. So I usually put one at zero, zero. I think the standard is usually, whoops, press the wrong button there. You usually put one at zero, zero, and then put one at like one, one. Because this essentially just means you have all the freedom in the world. This is a linear relationship. And yeah, you're good to go. In one second, you'll go from zero to one, which is pretty much the most basic timeline you can have. It's completely linear. Now, we're gonna go back to the event graph and we're gonna look at a few things. We're gonna compare it to the one I already have here. The way this works is you're going to bring your code flow into the play on the timeline. Now the play just means start this timeline essentially. There's a bunch of other things which are pretty self-explanatory, but for now, we just need the play. We wanna play from the start to the end and that's it. You have an update, a finished, and then you have this weird named variable, like pro projectile move up track. And I've called this timeline value. What is this? So this is basically how far along you are on the timeline. And this lerp node, what a lerp node is, it's linear interpolation. So basically it'll bring you from A to B 
at the rate that you've given it. So alpha is essentially how far along we are, the value that we are between A and B. And this will keep running, this timeline will keep running once we put the play into it. So it's going to update and it's going to update the world location of the particle system based on the linear interpolation value of the start and location and this alpha. Now, I know that's very confusing the first time you're seeing it. To be quite frank, it can be confusing when you know what it is just by looking at it and trying to keep track of everything. So I don't blame, I don't blame you if you're confused, trust me. However, uh, my recommendation would be just add this logic, try it out. This is pretty much the, the way you'll do all of your timelines. Not necessarily with Lerp and all, but uh, just in general, you'll be using a lot of timelines with Lerp or with a mathematical operation and then performing whatever it is that you're trying to do, in this case, set the world location on update. And then on finished, we determine the other logic that we want. So basically how we can wrap up this actor and wrap up the timeline. So yes, it is very confusing and I apologize for that, but that's kind of just how you're supposed to use timelines and they're a little bit weird. So you can feel free to play around with this graph. You can see I have 250 and I go from zero to 250. Well, 2.5. So, you know, you can play around with it, extend the time or extend how fast it rises or how slow it rises. But on update, take your start and location, drag off of one of them called lerp. It'll say lerp vector. Pass in the actual track value, which is the name of this will be the track name. And that returns a value. So pass in that value to the alpha of the lerp and then grab your particle system again. Okay. And then just say set world location. And there you go. Oops, I didn't mean to actually do it there. There we go. Lastly, when it's finished, I go ahead and call destroy actor. You'll probably want an effect here or you'll even want it to go back into the ground or something. I just called destroy actor because I feel like at this point we've done enough that uh, you understand what's going on when we destroy it. Okay, so this is the entire projectile, but see how that was a little bit weird, something we've never done before, because the logic was so specific there. The logic was literally everything we had to, we wanted to do, we had to force to do. There's no real way to shortcut that and be more efficient. You kind of just have to, to go uh, as, as specific as you need to get the effect you want. And that's why some of these special attacks or uh, projectiles can be a little bit complicated. Now, don't worry, we're almost done. We need to do, we need to figure out where to spawn it, and I'm gonna use the ground spawn actor for that, and we also need to actually spawn it in the NMBP. So let's go into our level real quick. Should have the stage in here, trail the Ys. Now, I have this actor in here called the ground spawn actor. It's a new actor I've made, so you know how to make one by now. Just add new, blueprint class, wherever you want it, and just use actor as the parent class. We're not applying anything in the event graph. We're not even really changing anything about him. He's just going to be something we can place in the scene to spawn things at ground level. The reason for that is because if we try to use the character and their care and the ground level for the character, they could be jumping. So if you use their z-axis, then you know you might not get the right value that you want. Also, you might not be able to use the same value on every level, especially if you have say knock knock through walls and you knocked your opponent through a wall then you know they could be at a different height they could be at a different location so we need these ground spawn actors to kind of use uh you know we need to use their location to figure out where the ground is and where we should spawn certain things at we can actually do this for more than just this but i'll get into that later this is already going to be enough of an episode all right so go ahead and go to add component and I usually just add a cube for this. My exact settings are I've made it 0.3 for the scale all around the board. I've disabled all sort of uh, generating hit events and just events in general the character cannot step up on and I've added no collision. I've left it to be visible in the editor but hidden it in the game so that the player cannot see it because it, you know it's just a cube we don't really want to see that. And that's it. You don't need anything else here. It's literally just a base actor that we can put somewhere and use. So I put him directly on the ground. It's kind of hard to see, um, especially with where he's at, but he is actually touching the ground 
Uh, he's actually probably a little bit off the ground by a few pixels, but it's good enough for me. You know, you can be as specific as you want with it, but for me, I think it looks good. I'm gonna now go back to my main menu, but now that we've placed that in the scene, we can grab that in our Anim BP. You can also grab it in your character BP and pass it to your Anim BP if you don't wanna put all this in your animation blueprint. But the logic's pretty simple. At the end of begin play, we have all these things getting set, like our cameras. I get all actors of class. I get uh, the ground spawn actor. I get index zero. And then instead of like saving a reference to that, all I need is the Z location. So I make a float and I call it ground value. I uh, get actor location of the index we grabbed from this array. I go ahead and I split the actor. So let me show you. We have get actor location. You can right click and split struct pin and then just drag the Z into the ground value. And now you'll have this ground value. For me, it is negative 55 on trail of the Y's, but this is why this is important. Different levels can have it at different locations. I mean, you know, you don't want to necessarily move your whole level to be consistent and then base everything off of a single number. If you base it off of an actor that you know is in the right location, it can be safer and just more efficient. All right, and now all we need to do is spawn our projectile and spawn it at the right spot. There are a few other things we should do, like uh, if I go to the hitbox actor BP, we should add a few other things for my specific logic because I don't want to do certain things. Remember I said I didn't want to destroy it and I didn't want to uh, play a hit effect. In our hitbox actor BP, uh, before what I was doing in the default projectile BP, the, the fireball, I was just doing on component begin overlap of the static mesh or of the particle system. But now what I've done is we're going to use the hitbox for the, the projectiles. So I have on component begin overlap of the hitbox display within our hitbox actor BP. And I've copied and pasted the logic, but I'll go through it really quickly. So I grab the hitbox type that we have. Since we're in the hitbox actor, we have direct access to that. And I'm making sure it's a projectile. We don't want to change any of the logic we're already doing for collisions with hitboxes right now. We just want to be able to access these collisions if they're a projectile and do special logic, such as play the hit effect. So I make sure I switch on the hitbox actor. If it's a projectile, cast the hurtbox actor being the thing that we collided with. Meaning, did this projectile, did this hitbox, collide with the hurt box. Then we're gonna get the owner of the hurt box, cast it to a fighter template character, and make sure that the fighter template character is not the owner of this hit box. Remember, this is just a check we do to say, is the owner of this hit box attacking themselves? If so, don't deal any damage. And we're doing the same thing here. So drag off of your fighter template character, your actor reference, and do not equal. Do get owner and put it in there branch. If they're not equal, then we call take damage on that actor. This means we call take damage on the enemy. Now this, the rest of this logic is specific to projectiles. I'm going to do something called get attach parent actor. And since this hitbox gets attached to the projectile, this will bring up the projectile as the, that's the parent actor. I check if the projectile is valid and then I do some additional logic with it. First of all, I set the collision to be false. Once the parent has collided with the actor, we no longer want to enable collision. So the projectile hit the opponent, say, say that it's the fireball. The fireball hits the opponent. Well, we don't want it to burn through their health. I mean, you can, you can set that up for specific projectiles, but it, since we want to destroy that one upon collision, we want to disable collision. So set actor enable collision, just turn it to false. Then I'm going to cast the parent actor, remember this is the projectile, to the type that we want to look for. We want to see if this is a default projectile BP. Since there are different projectiles that we can have or different classes we can have for those projectiles, we have to make sure we're using the same one that we want for all of our logic. The, the parent class of all the projectiles is the best one to use. That's a default projectile BP. Then I say, should display hit effect? And if should display hit effect is true, then we spawn the emitter at location like we were doing in the prior episode. Okay? So remember, should display hit effect is what we have in these class defaults and should be destroyed upon collision. So for the fireball, this will be true and it will spawn the emitter. Then, um, 
you can see I have my projectiles, this blue line at the bottom here. I get actor location and spawn the emitter at that location. Again, this is the same thing we were doing in the fireball, but I just want to show you that I'm doing it in here now. Then I also take the default projectile BP and grab the should be destroyed upon collision. And if it's true, destroy actor. This will also be true for the, the fireball. For the record, I should actually completely do this because you may want to be able to not play an effect, but destroy the actor upon collision. A little thing, but it can make all the difference if you need it down the line. There you go, something like that. It's a little bit uglier than I'd like, but you can see what's going on here. All right, so this fits our rules for both the fireball and the tornado. We play an effect for the fireball, not for the tornado. And we don't destroy the tornado, but we do destroy the fireball upon collision. And now it's our actual hitbox that's checking for collision as opposed to the particle system. Just gives us a little bit more freedom. It's not required you do it that way, but if you're gonna be using a lot of projectiles, you probably wanna use hitboxes as opposed to just the particle system collision. Also, the particle system collision will be a little bit heavier on the computer than just doing a simple box collision. All right, and now we're at the final part. So we have to spawn our tornado, our projectile that we want. We wanna create the hitbox and we wanna call a spawn projectile on it. Very similar to how we were doing the fireball. In fact, you can actually just look at this. Here's spawn fireball. You can see in this case, we were spawning the default projectile BP, which is the fireball, setting the owner to be the mutant character reference, using the player transform for where it spawns, and then create projectile hitbox spawn projectile. Okay, so not bad, not bad. Um, but at the same time, it's not exactly what we need for this case. For this case, we need the logic to be a little bit different. We don't wanna spawn the tornado on the player's transform. We wanna spawn it at the enemy's location. And this is where that other anim notify grab enemy location could be. If you want to give them some time and some buffer to, uh, you know, recognize the attack and get out of the way, you can actually grab their location here. So what I'm doing right here, you can grab their location, place it here, store it, and then use that location as opposed to grabbing a new one when that other anim notify fires. That will give them a little bit of time to get out of the way. We'll probably end up doing that for fairness later down the line, but for now this is good enough. And the way I'm gonna get the location for the transform, first of all, I split the transform as you can tell. So when you look at this, the spawn transform, as usual, you can right click and split struct pin and then I split the location again. And that's how I got it to look like this. So I grab our mutant character reference and then I grab the other player and then I grab actor location of that other player. I pass in the X and the Y because the X and the Y values they're going to be, you know, they, we always want them to be for the other player in this case. First of all, X is the depth, and we don't care about the depth. We just need to make sure that it's the same as what our fighters are on. So that's fine. The Y is the horizontal location, which we absolutely need to be, you know, based off the enemy player. And we don't want the Z of them. We want to do it off of the ground value and come out of the ground. So I grab our ground value variable that we used. I subtract 450 from it. This is an arbitrary value. You don't have to do this. This will depend on the size of your projectile, where the center of it is, where the origin of it is, all these different things. So you can either configure it here or you can play around with the item, the actor in the viewport, move it up and down, do whatever you want. That way you get it into the position you want. For me, I found that where I was placing the ground value on all my maps, uh, around 450 was a good spot. I can actually bring it down even a little bit lower. But this is just an arbitrary value. You can even place it right at the ground value and it'll be fine. But for me, it was higher than I wanted it to be. So I added an arbitrary offset to make it look better. And then what we want to do is spawn actor from class with these values. I should have said that first since we were already passing the information into it, but that's okay. Just do spawn actor from class. And then pick your class. Of course, I'm picking what I call projectile up from ground. And then I'm splitting my transform, splitting my location, and passing everything in as I said above. Make sure you also pass in the mutant character reference as the owner. Okay, 
So that's good, we've spawned it. We need to create the projectile hitbox now. Now, uh, just in case you missed this, because I know sometimes I add things in later episodes, I did add the transform to the projectile hitbox. It's the exact same way I added it to the proximity and active hitboxes if you've done that. If you haven't seen that, I'll go ahead and leave a link in the top right corner right now for that, which is, um, it basically shows you how to resize and, and reposition all hitboxes, all the hitboxes we have. So I will go ahead and, and link that in case you need it, but it's not any different, quite frankly. I just take the scale, drag it over here, and set actor scale 3D. That's the only only difference here for the transform on the projectile hitbox. And just for the record, I'm passing in a transform scale of 15 on the Z, one and one everything else. That way it's really tall. Um, it's kind of hard to see the hitbox with the actual tornado effect. Plus I'm pretty sure it gets put in the middle of the tornado. So I can show you that better in another episode. And, well, you'll just see it automatically when we do some of the other projectile episodes. But uh, just know that that's what I'm doing here. I made it a uh, scale on the Z of 15. And then we set actor scale 3D. Okay. All right. Um, and then in your create projectile hitbox, we are spawning the hitbox actor, attaching it to the uh, the projectile, which is what we're doing for the fireball. So when we do all this other logic, we don't have to, all the logic that we have in this function already works for the tornado. We don't have to change anything for it. Just change your values here for your damage. Make sure your type is projectile. And with that said, make sure your fireballs type is also projectile. Lastly, we have to call spawn projectile and we have to call it on the specific reference. So grab the class that we spawned and call spawn projectile on it. Now, once you've done that, you should be able to spawn your tornado into the game. So we'll take a quick look at this and I will also show you the fireball so you can see the hitbox because you can actually see the hitbox on that one. Uh, here we go, you can see the hitbox attached. It blows up and then uh, causes the hit effect. The character gets knocked back and then it gets destroyed. Okay, so now with the tornado, same thing. There you go. Hits him twice, he'll get up on his own if you don't force him. You can also force him. And there you go. This will work wherever you want. Now, if you do want it to be a little bit more on the ground, like in my case, how it's a little a little higher in the air, I can uh, adjust this modifier here and have like negative 750. Now you'll see it won't come out of the ground as much, but then I'll show you how to remedy that. I'm just trying to give you full freedom here. So you can see that was actually too low. It ended up coming out of the ground toward the bottom, but it was a little bit lower than we want. So we can make this negative 550. So there we go. You can see now, you can actually see the hitbox on this one because of the position I moved it to. And you can see how he's bouncing off of it. Now the hitbox does expand the whole way. I went ahead and made the hitbox 25 just so you can see it. But you can see it's coming up from the ground and hitting him. So you can adjust this effect all you want. And if you want it to uh, raise any faster, you can do a few things. First of all, you can set the end location to be higher. So if I made this end location 300, on the same timeline of 2.5 seconds that it takes, it's going to need to gain uh, more height more quickly to be able to reach that new end value that it's lurping between. You can also modify the timeline um, specifically, but there's no real reason to do that because we're doing a linear value here. You can see if I make it 300, it does go off the ground, which can look good if your effect supports it. Mine is really meant to stay on the ground. But there you go. So I'll play around with it one more time and we'll see if we can get this looking pretty nice, but I think that pretty much accomplishes the goal for today. I wanted to do like an up from the ground attack, but more importantly than that, I wanted to sort out projectiles, give you guys a better idea of how these projectiles and special attacks work, 
and give you some freedom to start playing around with your own special attacks. There we go. I think that looks perfect. That's probably how it'll stay. Because we can spawn it from anywhere. It comes up basically from the ground and goes to the edge of it. And it can punish the player by hitting him a few times, if done correctly. Um, it will depend on where your, your hurt box is and if you force a check collision like in other areas. There you go, guys. So that's how you can do special attacks, uh, more special attacks. Don't worry, we'll be doing plenty of one-off episodes like this. Not, not that they're one-offs, but one-off episodes where it's just for a specific attack type that you guys can look at. So we'll be doing plenty more of these. Don't worry about that. I've got already a ton in mind that I want to go through. But next week, we're going to be going over wall bounces and ground bounces. So meaning hitting your opponent into the edge of the screen, causing them to bounce off of it and hitting them against the ground, causing them to bounce off of that. Also, I forgot that I made these uh, I made these extended walls because I was trying to get the, the size of the stages the same. <laughs> so, ignore the walls at the moment. But anyway, yeah guys, so we'll be doing that next week. And anyway, I just wanna say thank you so much for watching this episode. If it helped you, please subscribe. It does more for me than anything else you can do for the channel, and I really appreciate it. I want to give a huge shout out to my Patreon membership and YouTube membership subscribers and supporters. Thank you very much for all that, but I really appreciate it just having people who are excited about this series and as, as excited as I am, so thank you guys so much. Lastly guys, if you want to come support us on Twitch or just see programming live streams here on YouTube, you can check them out in one of two places. So on Twitch, you can go uh, twitch.tv slash the road 27 or you can check out the live streams that happen right here on this channel every alternating Friday. I also leave a link to the YouTube channel for Sean the Road 27 here in case you just want to look at the archive streams that we've already done. I upload all the streams I do on the Twitch channel here on YouTube on that channel. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye guys.